Welcome back to What the Trans USA. It's episode eight, and we're talking about one thing and one thing only. And I bet you don't even know what it is. My name is Ketza. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. The world's on fire. Uh, <laughs> I'm Latina. And this election is incredibly stressful. Uh, as for a cool little fun fact, Halloween was nice, I guess. <laughs> yeah. This is Lizzie. I know I said last time I wasn't going to be here, but I am. My life thing has got pushed back. <laughs> Yay. My pronouns are they, them. I'm Clementine. Um, I use she, they pronouns. I've got a law degree. I don't practice law. Not that that would be very helpful in this situation anyways. But we're here to talk about the election. So let's dig in and talk a bit about what happened at the national level and what comes next. Yeah, so let's rip this band-aid off. Uh, <laughs> <sighs> oh, oh, good sound effect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Donald Trump won. Uh, that sucks. Uh, uh, none of us want to deal with that, but uh, unfortunately, uh. we live in uh, this timeline, and it's bad. Um, uh, as for the uh, uh, as for the Senate, the GOP didn't just win; they they won. They won. A, they they won massively. The GOP uh, uh, have uh, fifty three seats to the Democrats uh, forty six, and then I think there's like one seat that's independent. I think it's uh, two seats. There you go. As for the House, the results as of yet are undetermined. However, the GOP have 213 out of 218 needed for a majority. The Democrats have 203 out of 218 for a majority. So we are headed towards a full red government. Yeah, including the Supreme Court, which has a majority of Trump nominees on it at this point. Not all Trump nominees, but all GOP nominees um, in the majority for the six to three. And... The other thing that we know is that these justices are likely to retire during a Trump administration to make space for younger people who are in their 30s and 40s in all likelihood to be taken away to the Supreme Court for lifetime appointments. So it's a very concerning state of affairs all in all. I think it's worth digging in a bit about like why this happened and what's going on. Because I think one of the important things is that this was a winnable election. Like, none of this necessarily had to happen. If we look at the margin that Trump has won by, we obviously don't have the final, final results right now. But Trump is winning by a couple thousand votes in a handful of states, right? Key states that win the Electoral College in a major way. But Trump didn't get that many more votes than he got in 2020, right? Like 3 million more, I believe, right? Yeah, 3 million more or something like that right now. The Democrats just demobilized in excess of 13 million people. This is like an apocalyptic event for, for the national DNC. Honestly, apocalyptic sounds about right. I'm not a Democrat, but that's pretty... To demobilize... the And the, the, the demobilization has largely occurred from them attacking the left and moving more right wing. But if you're just a more mediocre right wing than the right wing, conservatives are just going to move right. And frankly, you're not going to get the conservative vote. That's not where all the votes are, but they're both sponsored and donated to by the same corporations. So, so I mean, like one of the things we saw is like Joe Biden got way more votes in 2020 than what Kamala got this time around. And I don't think that's necessarily because Joe Biden had, for example, the most liberal policy platform, right? He was not the most progressive candidate. But I think one of the key differences here is that Joe Biden wasn't beating up and wasn't like turning his back on the left side of the party. Joe Biden was much more like just boring. I guess <laughs> more like he was much more willing, willing to at least entertain the the verbiage of coalition talk, which is generally how united fronts against fascism prosper in electoral uh, settings. Yeah, and I mean, like, I don't think, for example, that Joe Biden actually persuaded a lot of Republican voters to vote against Trump. For example, I don't think a lot of these people were conservative voters. As we saw from Trump's numbers in 2020, it did not come close to matching 2016. In 2016, Trump had a different type of energy that turned out millions upon millions more voters for himself than he did in 2020. People were not motivated by what Trump had to say in 2020, and they weren't all that much more motivated in 2024 than they were in 2020 by what Trump had to say. But as Ketza, as you like really put it, like the Democrats completely failed to motivate people where they were able to do something in 2020, especially like on the heels of the pandemic and Trump's very poor response to it. Like there was an actual hope that they were able to build for a positive vision of the future. 
And I think this time, one of the big failures was not building that positive vision of the future and instead just saying, yeah, the Republicans are pretty right about most things and we're going to do kind of what they want to do. But like, you know, as a Democrat, a good way to describe it is, is they had what they had was hostage politics, right? The Democrats employed hostage politics. They said, we're going to do the same things as the Republicans, but we're going to be a little less bad about it. And if you don't vote for us, you're all going to die. That's the argument that they made. That's the argument they made for four years to shut down any movement to the left. Right. And it it didn't work. It didn't work because why would it work? At some point, uh, people are so beaten up, they stop caring. They start doing other things about it, whether it's dissociating, coping, or getting involved in, in a form of politics which is not reliant on elections. I think one of the big turning points on this was the DNC conference, right? When the DNC refused to put a Palestinian speaker um, from the non-committed movement, it was a really big sign as to where they were going with this election and which voters they were trying to influence. And it wasn't the people who showed up and won in 2020, right? These people were saying that they endorsed Kamala Harris, right? They wanted to endorse Kamala Harris. They wanted to show up and they still planned on voting for her. But the condition that they had for that was being able to speak, being able to talk about their points on the DNC's platform. And it's just fascinating to see that Kamala and the DNC made the decision to not let that happen. They made the decision to say to the people that we're going to vote for them, you don't have space here. You don't belong in our community. You don't belong on the stage with us. You don't get to say what you want to say. But you know who they did have was a lot of Republicans, a lot of cops, and a lot of people like Liz Cheney, like Dick Cheney, talking about how the Cheneys support Kamala Harris and things like that. And I think that is like a fundamental flaw because I don't think people like the Cheneys, for example, no, in general. Not at all. But B, the people who do like the Cheneys, I don't think they really want to vote for Kamala anyways no. if you're a Cheney supporter. Right, they want to vote for the Republican Party of Dick Cheney. Which does not exist. And the closest thing to it is the Republicans of today, not Kamala Harris. It is such a fundamental misunderstanding of how they won the election in the previous year. And it's the same misunderstanding that the Democrats keep doing decade after decade, where people show up when they offer a positive vision for the future and then fail to show up as soon as they stop doing that, as soon as they start using these politics of fear and trying to be, you know, just like the Republicans, but nice. Another thing to add on to that is that for the most part, the Democrats don't even make good on their promises. They are a party of false promises. Their entire platform is built on, we are going to make a lot of promises that are, generally speaking, this, so this election is a departure from that that i think only indicates what the road ahead for democrats looks like generally speaking the, the pattern of democrats is that on a national level they campaign on these big ticket things they either show tacit support for for more pro, for more progressive policies usually some extremely watered down version and then people take the compromise essentially and then democrats don't don't uh don't give them that either they then compromise on the compromise and this is, this is what they keep doing. They recuperate left-wing movements back into the political paradigm of the American state, which is a corporatic oligarchy. So th th this is the general strategy. On, down, on down ballot races, politicians don't have as much fuel because the, DN the DNC, 10, and Democrat Party at large throws all its money at the national election. So local ballots are forced to be more earnest by virtue of, of needing more grassroots support. And the more local you get, the more true this tends to be. Not always, but tends to be. They have to rely on their local political machines. Uh, like in Los Angeles, for example, it's the local Dem Democratic Party political machine. Now, in 2024, the Democrats didn't run on any progressive policies. The left showcased that, uh, that what people generally want and, and what the most what the most popular widespread policies are is to end the genocide in Palestine. Uh, the United States could end it today by, by refusing to send arms uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to recognize the sovereignty of Palestine. Uh, Medicare for all is still a talking point amongst a lot of people because, frankly, these Medicare prices are going crazy. So that trans rights is a major ticket item for the left. It's not a major ticket item for liberals. Liberals generally don't care. 
and I say liberals on a large scale, much of our audience are likely some progressive liberal trans people tend to be more progressive because we're forced to. And by interrogating ourselves, we tend to have to interrogate society, but it's not always true. The point of that is that there's all these progressive ticket items. The union push is overwhelmingly pushed by queer and uh, broadly trans people. Like the Starbucks union is broadly created by uh, uh, by left-wing trans and, and more broadly gay people. We have an entire new era of pushing for civil rights that is struggles to be born. The Democrats didn't run on any of that. Democrats don't want that. And in all fairness, this kind of echoes a more frustrating situation for queer people as it was in the original civil rights movement, which is to say the parties that be don't want us to have those civil rights. Yeah. A, a, a dignified population is more difficult to scare into, into being controlled. But 2024 is a departure from that strategy. They didn't just not do that. They actively campaigned against all those left-wing policies. They were... They, they had a, throughout these last four years, they've had a united front with Republicans on crushing the progressive movement, on progressing the left-wing movement, which in, in some cases includes a, a progressive com- a movement's coalitions. But broadly itself, there's a revival of the, uh, 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 of the anti-capitalist and uh, an anti-patriarchal left in the United States, which hasn't happened in a long time, not, not, since, like, the, not since the death of the left in the United States in the 90s. And as you said, Ketzel, like, I mean, the Democrats are very much not interested in that. Um, I think it's no. funny because we can go back to the DNC where they invited someone like Hassan to come in and be a commentator, to be one of their online presenters, right? Mm-hmm. And very quickly, Hassan was asked to leave. He was told that he was no longer welcome there. And Hassan is not even the most, like, anarchist, the most, like, out there person on the internet, right? No, he's very milk toast left yeah, things it's like Hassan, he's vaguely left wing. Hassan is nice. I like Hassan enough. He's a fine guy, as far as I know, right? I'm not here to like sugar in his character, but like he's not a radical, like throwing a fucking Molotov cocktail at the DNC. You know, he's just there to fucking stream to Twitch. And that was too much for the Democrats, right? That was too much. Him asking questions about Kamala's policy and why they wouldn't allow a Palestinian speaker was too much for the DNC. And, like, again, Republicans are allowed at these events. Republicans were invited to cover these events, to be there and to be present, to be on stage and platformed by the Democrats. And I think that just shows, like, even if the Democrats say they believe in trans rights, right, and want to support trans rights, their actions that they took this election completely, like, do not line up with that. You are the thing that you do, right? Exactly. Even if that's what you want to do, you have accomplished a completely opposite result. You have done something very unproductive and very harmful, and, like, they need to take accountability from that and recognize where they went wrong and not, like, blame trans people or blame people who, like, do not support a genocide for not showing up when your party is unwilling to even show up for you on, like, a baseline economic level. Right. Making our material conditions a place that is like better than where we were. Like, don't get me wrong. This is better than living under a fascist, like out and out state like Donald Trump. But the material conditions that we all live in are not great. They're all pretty bad. And there's a lot of things that a Democratic Party could have done, especially when they had control of government for two years. I understand that there are limitations, like with the filibuster in those early days, right? And people like Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema did not want to play nice. They didn't want to play with the filibuster. They didn't want to support working class people and what we need. But I think there could be a lot more that could have happened between then and today than what we saw happen. And especially the past two years, I think there's a lot more that could have happened with the presidency using executive authority, because I think we're going to see what can happen with the presidency using executive authority under a Trump administration. Yes, the Republican Party is, frankly, dramatically more effective at wielding the machine of the state, which is terrifying because they're the more evil ones, right? But when you have slight, when you get rid of all your moral presumptions uh, in state of maximizing power, you begin to realize just how powerful uh, a monopoly on violence truly can be, which is horrifying. And we're probably in for a very rough four years. But very. it's not the end of the world. Something I want to say as well is that uh, uh, Stafford Beer is a systems theorist who's, uh, who points out that the purpose of a system is what it does. The Democratic Party 
as a system is there to ensure that left-wing movements do not gain uh, political power, hege hegemony. It's what they're, they're there to do. It's what they've staked themselves on doing. And they've been incredibly effective at it. Since the Democratic Party started doing that, FDR, the left has never won substantive gains beyond, beyond the FD era New Deal. Everything else has been trickling until it got torn away. If we're going to survive, we need to think beyond that, that, the current system of politics, the Democrat-Republican dichotomy, the, uh, the false dichotomy of the Democrats and Republicans. Uh, we need to think beyond the electoral system in general. In the 60s and 70s, rights were not won on the ballot. They were won in the street. They were won by people will, uh, willing to put everything on the line because they had nothing to lose. If we want to, if we want to survive, dignity does not come from begging for your rights. It comes from taking them. With how presidencies work, yes, we have the four years of the presidency, but we also have a period of what the first year, two years after, where some of those things are still kind of in effect, sometimes longer, um, like policies that are written into a place. So, like, it could take longer than these f next four years for us to really see any positive changes after this presidency unfortunately at least on a, on a legal scale yeah. yeah on a legal scale yeah so i mean uh, yes we're gonna have a long four years but it's this is ultimately going to be a longer than four year battle and i i i'm not trying to be a, down, a debbie downer on this i'm not trying to like discourage people i'm just trying to like be realistic this is going to be a longer than four year battle it's gonna be a long hard tiring battle but it's a fight that we have to fight it's a battle we cannot give up on and we cannot step back on we're not in a situation where we can where we can build our strategy in four-year increments we, we we haven't been in that situation but a lot of people have held on to that because it's terrifying to step beyond the electoral bounds that's where things get real it's where they, things can get terrifying. It's where things can become terrifying because the world is truly terrifying when you stop doing what it wants you to do. But the strategy going forward needs to be building dual power. It needs to be building systems of power that can disrupt, upend, and disable the capacity of the state to make good on its promise of domination. That means, un first and foremost, that means unions. That means being able, tenants unions, worker unions. Why? Because if you can disable the economy, you can bully your local government into doing what you want. If you do it on a large enough scale, you can upend an entire political system by force, the sheer force of economic crash. We saw what happened in 2020 when the, when the economy stopped working for six months. If we can intentionally orchestrate that with a system of care designed to for us to withstand it, we can force this world to do whatever it is that the that the people want it to do. Because ultimately our governments were supposed to be representatives of what we need and want as the people of the, the, the nation, the country, the, sit, the cities, states, whatever, how be it. And unfortunately our governments are not that and they have not been that for a while now. Probably I think ever. Probably ever. Like realistically like more so than people really want to admit mm -hmm. the the next thing that we uh, uh, the next big part is it, it, it is social activism is becoming organized the, the reality is we are already organized our bodies our lives our souls everything about us is organized to maintain the existing system and the existing system is built to kill us and it's what it's built to do uh, we are being forced to be complicit in our own torture it is built to kill us, and it is built to make the rich richer. Right. So if if we want to upend that, we don't just have to... It's not just about organizing. It's about reorganizing the system that is our own bodies. What, are we, what we are doing with our labor. How we are doing with our labor. With whom. And to what ends. Right? Uh, for some people, that means getting uh, uh, involved in activist circles. Things like, you know, Food Not Bombs, for instance. Great place to start. Uh, your uh, your local union, etc. So for some people, it means may if you are trans and you're listening to this, we just we are a trans news <laughs> podcast. Right. It's probably you. And if you don't know that yet, 
welcome to the family. Uh, <laughs> but you can't just tell people they're trans. It's your I know. <laughs> it's not Harry Potter with the hat and tells you. Yeah, when I, you go. Yeah, you're trans. Yeah, I know. Right? That's the egg. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm messing with you. But in all seriousness, <laughs> but in all seriousness, if you're listening to this, talk to your trans friends. Get get connected to them. If you're cis, you have certain privileges that trans people don't have. You it, it, it behooves you to coordinate with tra- with trans people in your lives to make each other's lives better. Network networks of support are going to be necessary. We can talk a long time about how bad now is, but I think it behooves us to uh, uh, to, to to strategize on how to make however bad it's going to be, one, not as bad as it could, and two, stop it if possible. Reality is built on the hope of action, you know? Uh, so long as you take action, there is hope. So long as we draw breath, there is life. So long as there are people willing to fight, there is hope. Yeah, I think we've been convinced for a long time that politics starts and ends at the ballot box. It's like the thing you do like one day out of the year, you know, or like if you're doing politics, you're working on a campaign or some dumb thing like that, right? Where politics is so much more than that. Politics is making sure your mom knows why you need hormones, you know, and like seeing if she can help you fucking get them, you know, figuring things out with people in your community. Like Ketza said, like knowing other queer people, like knowing cis allies. I have a good friend who is in a different state for me that is more trans inclusive. And we've already had conversations about hormones and things like that and what steps we can take in the future. Things you can also do to be proactive in the face of a system that is going to be changing is that you should know that systems take time to change and they take time to get things done for you. So if you haven't updated your passport or your birth certificate, if that's capable of doing that, your driver's license, if you're able to update your documents and your trans, do that. Do that as soon as you can because A, it's going to take time for it to get done. You still have time. You still have time today to get this stuff done. Because the future is uncertain, but you can still do it. And the other thing is, once it's done, it's much harder for them to undo it, right? Even if they say pass some like executive order saying all trans passports are not getting issued again. Okay, so that stops people from getting them, which fucking sucks, right? That's horrible. But if you have your passport updated, it's going to be a lot harder for them and it costs a lot more money for them to send people with guns to your door to try and take your passport or something or to try and like figure this stuff out it's like protecting yourself by taking that proactive action make it as hard for the system to fuck you over as possible right remember ultimately before they can target you it needs to go through some bureaucrat who then has to locate you that takes time there's a lot of people here and even though you know there's about what like two million uh out trans people that's still a very large population uh, also, most of the people who are currently in the government do not want to be doing this. That's not how they want to spend their time. They're going to have to fire a ton of people to get this done, right? They're going to have to hire a ton of people. Also, I don't think there's that many conservative sickos who want to spend all day Googling trans people. Right. Fascist states tend to be counter to the uh, counter to, to the narrative that they propose to the world, which is that they are the iron fist of law and all powerful fascist states tend to be run as a one gigantic train wreck they are they are efficient they are efficient at only one thing and one thing only and it's concentrating power in their hands however to organize a nation you need a lot more than concentrated power you need uh expertise and systems operating and a lot of them aren't good at it they're ideologues they're not patient they can't deal with it. Over time, they can become competent with it, and that's where, and that's why. And it speaks to your point. There will come a time when they are likely at their most competent in the next four years. That doesn't say much, but it does mean that update your shit now. Get things ready now. You, if you need to stockpile hormones while it's still legal to do so, do so. If you don't have the money to, talk to your friends. Stockpile hormones for for yourself, for other people. That's this is how you protect people. You want to uh, uh, you want to reduce the trans suicide rate. Do it through force of kindness, right? And there's something I do want to say, particularly for our baby gays and our baby trans who you know are just like they're just figuring out their identities and everything i know all of this seems super huge and super overwhelming i get it um i have been out as not being straight for since let's see 
I was 13 when I came out. I was 12 when I was figuring it out. I am almost 30 now. Literally, my birthday is inauguration day. I'm not looking forward to my 30th birthday. However, I'm still figuring things out, being as I just only recently realized I'm a part of the trans community, being non-binary. Everything feels huge and overwhelming and confusing, and I'm still learning, which thank you so much to Clementine and Ketza for helping me learn and giving me resources and everything. I love and I appreciate you guys. That's the thing. Find people in your community. Find community. Reach out to them. Do your research. Be willing to ask questions and be willing to to listen and to learn because that's how we're going to be able to make change is by learning through history, learning from mistakes and being able to take that, implement it within yourself and implement it within the community and the world as a whole. Yes, everything seems huge and scary and confusing and everything, but don't let that stop you. It's going to be uncomfortable. I will tell you that. Don't let that stop you. Never stop learning. Never stop being willing to learn. Be willing to listen to the people in your community who are willing to help you learn as well. And even people in other communities. Because, like, I mean, I'm, I'm white. I, I, I tried to do my best to think about things from other people's perspective and everything. But I have a very limited perspective. I'm, I was raised a white military kid. Like, I have a very limited, narrow world point. I'm trying desperately to to expand but I can only do so much on my own and that's why I'm so grateful to the people in my life who are willing to help me see these other viewpoints these other histories and ver- and and stories that I wouldn't know necessarily like we were talking about earlier before we started the podcast some things that I have never heard of before and I'm so grateful to to them being willing to share this with me Ketza told me some things today and I'm like I've never heard of this before so be willing to listen yes it's going to be scary and overwhelming but don't let that stop you just like how when you're a kid and you're just learning to read you're just learning to walk you're just learning to talk everything seems scary big and overwhelming but now you know you're you're older you're you walk if you're able to you're you're able to talk for you know for most part even if words are hard you know you everybody starts somewhere don't let the beginning of your journey discourage or scare you it's never too late to transition. Exactly. It is never too late to transition. And the other thing is that everybody has said, but we're going to keep saying it, is that trans people have existed before HRT. We've existed with HRT. Like, hell, I spent, what, two plus decades of my life without HRT, and I was still fucking trans the entire time. And even if it goes away, we're still going to be here. We will still do things to get through this. It's never too late to start. And wherever you're at is the right place for you to be. The the greatest lie that we are told, not just in this country, but around the world, but in the context of right now, the United States, is that you are powerless. You are not powerless. The only time you people get told they are powerless is when those who seek to control them, to abuse them, are existentially terrified of your power. You are not powerless. Power power is is deciding not to believe the lie that you are that you are here only to be controlled power is is learning that you're not alone there's probably like five at least five other people in your town or community all believing that they're alone you're not you're just not coordinated and you can and that's just the and that's just a logistics problem you can solve that you can solve that the next four years are not one gigantic problem. It's a million little steps. And if you can and if you can take just one of those steps, you can take all of them. Thank you both. I think that's such a great segue into like, how do we beat fascism? And I think we all know the number one rule. And if you don't know the number one rule, it's don't kill yourself. That's all you have to do is you just don't kill yourself, right? As a, a whatever that might sound like to you, don't do it. Just don't kill yourself. That's the one thing you have to do to beat a fascist state because that's what they fucking want. And so your job is to make that as hard as fucking possible, right? Like imagine the press, right? Nobody wants to be the person who killed themselves, right? The person who let the fascist like get to you. And the other thing is like, they'll have fun. I'm like, I don't want them to have any fun, right? I'm here to have fun. 
I'm going to enjoy myself regardless of what the fascist state wants from me, because that makes them fucking mad. That makes them so angry because they can't control our lives. They don't have the power to do that, right? We can claim that back. And, and if if everything seems too big, too scary, too overwhelming, too hostile towards you, like you feel like everything is geared towards trying to kill you, then be spiteful, be petty, stay alive to spite them, stay alive to be petty. For example, I have family that never wanted me to be born. And I know for a fact that some of them are dead and the ones that are still alive, that uh, they are quite a few of them very conservative. And so one of my reasons to stay alive these past five, 10 years has been to spite them. Where I live, I go by a cemetery semi-regularly that some of that family that did not want me to be born is buried. And every single time I go by, I say, fuck you. I'm still alive. I am still here. I am exactly the kind of person you hated. And I am staying alive just to spite you. And I flip off that cemetery as I drive by. If anything gives you the drive to stay alive, whatever it is, find it. Hold on to it. Do not let anybody invalidate it or take it away from you be it spite be it hope be it pettiness whatever it is grab onto it with both hands wrap your arms around it sink your teeth into it and do not let anybody rip it away from you another great thing you can do is to give yourself obligations give yourself responsibilities to other people in your community because those people will have responsibilities to you too and those responsibilities are reasons to be here tomorrow Sometimes, you know, all it takes is one reason to not do it. All it takes is just a moment because intense suicidal ideation passes. It passes within minutes to hours. It is not something that you're going to be in for two fucking days, right? You're not going to be there for four years. These are momentary things that you can get through if you take the time today to put systems into place to make it harder to act on that. If you, for example, are at risk, you might not need to have a gun with you. It's okay to have guns for community defense. They're excellent resources for when we need them. But you don't individually need a gun if you're at risk of it. It might be better for a friend who isn't at risk to hold that gun for you. So if the time comes that you all need that to band together, to stay safe in these next four years, you have it and it's available. But in those 30 minutes to a few hours where you're really feeling something, you don't need that gun. You don't need it with you today. Yeah. And like, I know I just gave a whole like tirade of, you know, spite, hold on to that to stay alive. But sometimes that's not enough. Some days that's not enough for me. Some days I have to look at my cat and be like, okay, he's relying on me. He he would absolutely miss me. And I know this for a fact because I spent a week at my grandparents' house, house sitting and dog sitting for them. And he did not like me being gone at all. He missed me. If that's your reason, hold on to that. If you're neurodivergent, imagine how much effort it's going to be to like get your cat a new home. Because like you're not going to yeah. leave the cat alone. You're going to like be good and rehome yeah. the cat. But like that's like an hour at least. And like I I don't have the energy to do that. And so like obviously <laughs> we got to feed right. the cats. And then also like I'm I'm a, very openly I am a huge nerd. I'm a huge K-pop fan as well. I have to think. Okay, well I have a lot of collection stuff. Who, who's who's going to who's going to take my collection stuff, right? Like, I mean, I, I realistically, I know how I have friends who would gladly take some of my collection. However, I, I'm i proud of my collection and I want to continue working on that. I'm proud of all the K-pop stuff I have. And there's more K-pop stuff coming out soon for me that I really am excited for. So if that's a, a, something that you, you're going to use to keep going, okay, well, there's this next K-pop comeback. Okay, well, there's this next movie, this next book, this next video game, this next rock album or, or or pop album yeah what find a reason even if that reason changes day to day please stay alive i or i know there's already been a lot of people who have felt like all hope is lost and have gone ahead and just taken their lives and that breaks my heart and to those families and to those friends of those people who have i'm so sorry and my heart is here for you and i hope you are able to find some peace However, for those who are still alive and who are still struggling with this, please, I implore with you, 
stay alive. Find a reason to stay alive, even if it is different every single time. We are here and we do love you guys. You are our community and we don't want to lose anybody. Every now and then, my friends and I have a... have a, just banger quotes. We you ever just have like a moment where you say something that's just so cool in retrospect? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know it, it happens. <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, but he was saying, you know, you you, uh, you you can outlast their darkest fantasies. You know, you you, you can outlive their uh, their darkest dreams. We we don't need we we don't need big dreams. It's fine to have them. We don't need big dreams to survive. What we need is each other. What we need is, is the capacity to remember that no matter how bad today is, and if you forget it, that's that's what friends are for. You can't mm-hmm. you contact your friends. You you can set up a regular call with them, or even just a text. Just say, "Hey, I'm okay." Uh, uh, like uh, like Clementine said, obligations. Get activating a community. A lot of time. To- a lot of times, the uh, 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 the uh, the intense compulsion to end oneself comes from a profound lack. of 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 control in your own life you know how you take control back control is and is the act of existing intentionally so exist intentionally do do things because you want to do them even if they're hard even if they feel impossible if they feel impossible find just one other person i have a coworker who's like He's, he, he, you know, he's kind of weird, but I'm kind of weird. And we've talked and we want to like set up a community garden. Why? Because he likes gardening and doesn't like having to pay for groceries. That's enough of a reason. That's enough of a reason. I've seen this guy go from jaded and cynical to profoundly hopeful just because he, he met someone who refuses to be jaded and cynical. Be, being strong is not about being a diamond that can weather anything. Think, think about strength for a moment. If, if you put a diamond in, in a river, what's going to win? The river, right? Because erosion. If, and I was telling this to one of my friends who was really going through it like yesterday. That's why it's on my mind. The strength is not about holding everything in. It is not about becoming the most rigid, unmoving object. It is about recognizing there is a flow to things and to become part of that flow. It is, it is to recognize that if you are ever changing, if you are never obstructing your flow of emotions, never obstructing your flow of action, if you are allowing yourself to self-actualize as much as you can. These these scenarios are not great for self-actualizing. Let me fucking tell you. <laughs> but it can be done. It must be done. It is not. It, it is not. It, it, it's not uh, so small as a moral imperative. It is a personal imperative. Uh, and I think those are much bigger. You uh, uh, find people you can be vulnerable uh, with. Learn to be vulnerable. That is how we protect each other. Fascism presents itself as an impenetrable mountain. But remember, the oldest mountains in the United States are small because they've been eroded by the wind. The the largest canyon in the world was eroded by by a dinky river. You can outlast it. If the compulsion to change is enough to completely reshape our physical reality in in a very physical and often brutal way, then the desire to survive, the desire to allow you to recognize and become and be aware of your changes is strong enough to weather whatever mountain the monsters around us are uh, oh, want to place in front of us. The other thing is that everything that the fascists promise is hollow. They have nothing to actually support or substantiate what they have. They have violence and coercion, which is painful and horrifying. But it's not reality. It's not a fix to anything that got them to where they're at, right? It does not solve the material conditions of our reality, and it's not going to do anything besides make things worse for people. And people, humanity, has a much stronger willpower. As Ketza has talked about, like, it's just we are so much more than fascism because fascism has nothing. They're the most rigid people around. Right. And they're just going to fucking break as soon as they're in this. Even something like Hitler and the Third Reich, they did not last for a long period of time. 13 something years in power. And you can do a lot of terrible fucking shit in 13 years. But 13 years is not as long as you are going to be alive. You can be alive for way more than 13 years. You can see a whole lot of different things in that time. And like the only way through it is together. That's why I say community. Don't like, yes, have, you know, 
the, the your core small smaller group that you can turn to, to for just about anything but have a larger community outside of that because people are people people are human they need you know they may not be in a headspace where they can necessarily be there for you they may have prior obligations and they can't necessarily get to their phone or get to you right then and there so don't be afraid to have a larger community if that's a discord server with a whole bunch of people where you just say hey i'm not doing great or you just put it on i don't like blue sky or twitter what just on social media like hey i'm not doing great could somebody out there reach out to me don't be afraid to do that i've done that before and somebody did reach out to me and guess what i'm still here because of that at least from that moment like for that moment that was what i needed don't be afraid to reach out i also can't recommend getting involved in your local community enough there are people and organizations that need you there are people and organizations that are like you and that once you're around there are people who are trying to who are trying to create organization and they don't know yet that you are there and the other thing is like as scary as it is I have had so many more positive interactions as a trans person interacting with people in real life than I have with people on the internet, right? That's some lady at Winco compliment my hair. It yeah. was great. I had a nappy hair day, but she was like, yeah. <laughs> state senator in the state of Ohio, a Republican elected official, once told me that I looked like one of the attractive ladies in his daughter's fitness class, which is a very strange, <laughs> awkward compliment to receive from a state senator that you were just trying to lobby for housing rights. And affordable housing. Thank you for telling me that I'm hot. I don't know why you are thinking about the attractive women in your daughter's fitness class or why you felt compelled to tell me about it. Yeah, a little creepy. A little but creepy. It's... But the reality is, like, I sound like this when I talk to people. And I don't think I pass like that. But, you know, I apparently look good enough to get a compliment from this guy. Even though I bet he voted for Donald Trump. And so, like, the reality is, like, when you are interacting in person, people are much less likely to be, like, what is going on on the television or what J.D. Vance or Donald Trump feel like saying on TV. Most people just want to be normal and have a rather, like, normal to them interaction with you and get through their day, right? And a lot of times we agree on a lot of things, even if we end up voting for different people. There's a lot of things that we can get done together and make positive change on. And on the flip side, frankly, we've seen that liberalism as an establishment is not here for us. Mm -hmm. It's it can't be here for us. It's it's designed to recuperate our dreams. Our dreams are our dreams are larger than the confines of a ballot box. They uh, 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 they dream of marginal improvement. We dream of freedom. Right. Even the civil rights movement wanted more than the ballot box. Yeah, they wanted so a social revolution. They wanted to unmake the system of capitalism. Many of them wanted to unmake the system of of, of the state and patriarchy altogether. Remember that the uh, remember always remember this the uh, the entire queer rights movement, the entire gay rights movement, started with two things. It started with it, it, it started with Marsha Chuck and a brick, and it started and it started with the Gay Liberation Front, which was a bunch of radical gay socialists. Riot. Never forget. Uh, 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 never forget that. Find your radicals. Be careful who you join, by the way. There are a lot of organizations that call themselves radical, but they're cults. For instance, do yeah. not join PSL or the Revcom if they're evil. <laughs> but yeah, be careful because most people who are in a cult don't realize they're in a cult. <laughs> so, but here a, a, a great a great thing to think of is: Does this organization have a hierarchy? Avoid it. Most of the time, hierarchies uh, hierarchies are designed to 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 serve the hierarchs. Don't. We've been mastered enough. If you want to survive, be, uh, become ungovernable, right? So, so find your local organization. Sometimes it's food, not bombs. Sometimes that's Scow in Houston. There's the Space City Anarchist Organization. Uh, uh, sometimes that's your sometimes that's your local union. Sometimes that organization, quote unquote, is three coworkers who are really cool, and you talk to them, invite them over to your house, and start hanging out a lot, and start realizing you have the same beliefs and a desire to make the world a little less dog water. I think that brings us towards our trans joy, which is that if you actually support trans people and you actually show up for your community in a material way fun fact you can win elections you can actually get elected in america not the, not in, the hardest either <laughs> well and it's in places like 
you might not expect. Like, for example, Montana electing mm-hmm. trans people. Um, Representative Zoe Zephyr won re-election to the Montana House of State House of Representatives um, in their state government, right? And she won 80% of the vote in her district, Woo! right? That and is this so is, good. Round of applause. Yeah, like, that's not something that easily happens, right? Even in Democratic strongholds, you know, places like Chicago, you're not necessarily winning 80% of the vote. Right. The stronghold usually defined by like ten percent, right? Eighty percent is enormous. Yeah, like getting sixty percent of the vote is like a big deal. Eighty percent is wild, and that's because she shows up. She campaigns on things like filling potholes, and then when she's in office, she actually fills the pothole. Even when the Republicans do things like make her sit outside of the uh, state legislature and not let her in. Uh, she sat outside and worked on the bench until they let her back in the room. As Katza said, become ungovernable. Even if you're in the government and the government tries to kick you out and not let you in, you show up anyways and you keep doing your fucking job and then you win with 80% of the vote because they know what you're doing. Like, that's just incredible. Big props on that. Like, 80%. I just... Wow. It's impressive that that, that, a, that in a campaign impressive. defined in part by being as animositous towards trans people as possible, uh, uh, someone got a trans person got eighty percent of the vote. Fuck yeah! <laughs> another person, uh, uh, another person uh, that's good to talk about is we now have a new trans person, uh, 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 the first uh, out trans person to be elected to Congress, uh, Sarah McBride uh, from Delaware. Good job. Yay, Sarah! Congratulations, Sarah. That's really, really awesome. It's going to be just, like, as limited. You know, representation is very important, um, even if it is limited in its power. But it's important and, you know, very exciting, and hopefully get to see a lot of fun stuff and a lot of good work from Sarah McBride in the coming two years of her term, and hopefully more. I think that brings us to a close for today's episode. So Let's thank just you. Let's say one more time, please stay alive. Um, while I know for me, the hotlines never worked. I do know that they do work for some people. For example, the Trevor Project has had a 700% increase in calls. They are there for you to call. There are hotlines for you to call. Um, I think we should have a post uh, by the time this is out uh, with um, a various hotlines you can call for support that way you know that is an easily able to find post of a list of that i know like everybody is sharing you know hotlines you can call especially you know to prevent suicide right now however it doesn't hurt to share it more so save it to your phone literally yes save it to your phone a lot of these a lot of these hotlines are not three digits which is useful for calling in a panic save it to your phone Yes. Save it to your phone. Save it into a list on your phone. So like if you have a friend who is um, struggling and you've done everything you think you can and you think that the hotline might help them, send them that list of hotlines. Have that ready. Have it ready to share when you're on the streets or you see something on social media. You can just copy and paste it. It's already ready. Let's try. And I think having a post that we can share on the What the Trans um, social media is probably a good idea right now. So just, just again, we love you guys. We love everybody. Please try and stay alive. We don't, we don't need to give in to the fascists and give them what they want, which is us to not be there anymore. To put it succinctly, you're going to survive. Fuck Nazis. Yes. Well, don't Ooh. actually fuck no, Nazis. Don't actually have sex with fascists. It's a horrible idea. I mean, I mean it depends on uh, if you're winning or not. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we're going to cut to the Patreon. Uh, if you support us on Patreon, thank you so much. This wouldn't be possible without you. Lots of love. We'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Today's script was written by myself, Ketza, and Lizzie. It was presented by the same. Our theme music, as always, was composed by Waratsara Yui Carlberg. And we are now going to run through our list of wonderful Patreon producers, to whom we are infinitely grateful, for they keep our podcasting afloat. Starting with... Danny Gold Lex Phoenix Sebastian Singh Soprano Joe the Low Quality Edinby Andrea Brooks Jack Edwards Emily Roberts Disley Stefan Blakemore Noarte Needles and Threads 
Flaming Daphne. Dr. McGee. Genevieve Dixon. Rachel Harris. Katie Reynolds. Georgia Holden Burnett. Grabalicious. Nix Afon. Root Minus One. Gray. Elizabeth Anderson. Bernice Roust. Ellen Malore. Jay Hoskins. Troen. Ashley. Maddie B. Set Cab. Jane. Roberta de Pronk. Rose Absolute. Sarah. Sina. Kiki T. D. Sky Killian. Eric Widman. B. Jude. Monsieur Square. Fergus Evans. Anubis a Jackal. Kamina. Brandon Craig. Break the system. <laughs> Cyan Phillips. Uh, Heidi Reardon. Ezra. Lentil. Clara Vliami. Amelia. Corvina Ravenheart, the transmetal DJ from Twitch and VR Chat, will play St. Lucifer for props. Tabitha Joe Cox, a.k.a. Candy. Fiona McDonald. Merk, uh, droid. Ontologically unjust. Stella. Cindergoza. Rebecca Prentice. Crazy Crazy Richard. Richard. Dan Oblivion. Florence Stanley. Helen underscore. Elle Hollingsworth. Nick Ross. Melody Nix. Fiona Punchard. John. Nick Duffy. C.B. Bailey. Gordon Cameron. Ted Delphos. Kai Lewin. Vic Parsons. Patreon user. Vic Kelly. Catherine. Sabrina McVeigh. Cassius Adair. Melissa Brooks. Karakin 12. April Huller. Sophie Lewis. Alexandra Lilly. Claire Scott. Ariadne Penna. Lauren O'Neons. Bernard's Pink Jelly Bean. Lanos. Chris Hubley. All right, we did it. Thank you.